And it says, well, that's not what I hear in Origin of Life conferences. It's uh, quite the opposite, is that it's getting more and more intractable with each conference. And I was tempted to say, and by the way, I've never seen you in any of these Origin of Life conferences, but I didn't do that. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it was clear he wasn't uh, up on the literature. And so the debate went back and forth on, uh, you know, the Bible, uh, Big Bang cosmology, origin of life. Are humans really exceptional? And uh, if you want to listen or watch, the debate was uh, both uh, video and audio recorded. And it's going up on the British television, but it, we will get a link. So as soon as I get a link, I'll give you that link. But I love the way that um, uh, Justin ended it. He said, well, we spent an hour talking about the evidences. And he says, Hugh, what would it take scientifically for you to abandon your Christian worldview and walk over to uh, Peter's side? And I says, well, if you were to show me beyond any reasonable doubt scientifically that we human beings are no different than the plants and the animals, there's nothing exceptional about us, we're not distinct in any way, I said, that would be catastrophic to my Christian faith. And if you could show me the universe never had a beginning, and uh, there was no creator for the universe. That would be catastrophic to my Christian faith. Or if you can show me that uh, Jesus of Nazareth didn't rise bodily from the dead. And by the way, that's right in the book of Corinthians, where Paul says, if that didn't happen, we are to be pitied amongst all men because we believe a lie. And uh, we're dead in our sins. You got one of those? That might actually work. Okay, let's see. Uh, well, it's right here. We'll get that on. Maybe one of you can, yeah, here we go. And let's get this one on. Hugh, when you said television, you mean to the public? This, uh, this is going to be yeah, broadcast to the Yeah, it's radio and TV. It's called Premier, uh, uh, yeah, Premier TV, Premier Radio. It's a, so... Christian? Uh, Justin Brierley is a Christian. He never lets people know that he's a Christian. He's a very fair moderator. and uh, But his show is basically where he has a Christian and an atheist uh, debate one another on a topic. And it's not always a scientist. He often has philosophers, theologians, uh, and, and so on, do that kind of thing. Is Premier Radio and TV a Christian network? It is. And it broadcasts throughout the United Kingdom, uh, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, uh, parts of Canada. So, And uh, we will get the online link, so I'll be able to give you the link once it's available. But yeah, I love the way he ended it, saying, okay, Hugh, what would it take for you to abandon your Christian faith? Then he turned to uh, um, Peter Atkins and said, what would it take you, scientifically, uh, to abandon your atheism and become a follower of Jesus Christ? And he basically said, there is no evidence that would ever cause me to change my position. And he said, well, for the last hour, Justin jumped in at the very end. He said, the last hour we're talking about how we have to base our case on evidence. Yes. And now you're saying no amount of evidence would ever cause you to change your position. That's how the debate ended. So, yeah, but, you know, Peter uh, is also part of the British Humanist Association. So uh, that probably explains what's going on there. Hey, I'm actually going to be able to show you some stuff here. This is great. Okay. Uh, oh, maybe not. Let's see if I can actually get this up and running. Hmm. Come on. <coughs> okay. I thought I had this worked up. Let me make sure everything's connected here. Okay, that's connected. Now two. This should work. Um, up at the projector? No, it's on. Well, maybe you can figure this out. <laughs> okay, while we're trying to get that up and running, 
Okay. <laughs> Harry, let the service dog come in now. <laughs> okay. What I hope to be able to share with you is uh, a paper that got published uh, just this past Wednesday in the British journal Nature, which is considered to be the most prestigious science journal uh, in the world. And uh, it's basically a study trying to determine the date in which shales began to form. And the significant part there is that's the signal for the formation of continents. So if you've got water falling on kind of the land masses and that's being eroded in the oceans, you get shales. And so what they did is they looked at uh, 290 different shale sites around the world, uh, dated the shale sites, and basically for the first time performed triple oxygen isotope analysis of what's going on there. Uh, well, they looked at oxygen 18, oxygen 17, and oxygen 16. And previously, researchers had done studies on oxygen 18 to 16, but never included 17. And it's based on the old studies that they were able to determine the dates for the building up of the continents and based on what they did years ago, they were able to determine that the buildup of continental land masses uh, looked a particular way. And this is where I need to show the slide. <laughs> okay. Tell you what, why don't I put this to sleep and put this back up and see if that will work. Hopefully I didn't crash my computer. Uh-oh. All right. Okay, so looking just at oxygen 16 to 18 ratios of the shales around the world, this is work that was done, gee, 10, 15 years ago. They were able to determine that this is the history of the buildup of the continental land masses. And it basically is in sync with what you see in Genesis chapter 1, where it talks about Earth beginning as a water world. Genesis 1, 2, water covers the whole surface of the Earth. And so what we see here is that you begin indeed as a water world, then you get tiny volcanic islands, and then plate tectonics kicks in, and you can see these shales giving you the signature uh, that you have aggressive continental landmass buildup uh, when the Earth is about 2 billion years old, and then it gradually increases thereafter. Now, Genesis 1 puts the formation of the continents at the beginning of creation day 3. So you got six days of creation, beginning of creation day 3, and notice that the timing here is consistent. Uh, basically telling us that a little less than half, a little less than half of the uh, Earth's current age, we have this dramatic buildup of continental land masses. Okay, this new research basically changes this graph. And so this is what the new graph looks like. Yeah, basically saying, and that's the title of the paper, Rapid Emergence of Continents. Go back one? Okay, so that's what we thought the buildup of continental landmass history was a week ago. And then, now thanks to this paper, we realize it needs to be adjusted. It's roughly the same, but this is now done with much more precision. So this is very accurately determined, thanks to the fact that they did a study with three oxygen isotopes, not just two. Uh, but it shows that there's a much more dramatic emergence of continents than we thought just a week ago. And it's kind of the wording you see in Genesis chapter 1, that, you know, beginning of creation day 3, we see this rapid emergence of continental land masses all over the Earth. Now, what's really fun is that their study was sufficiently detailed, they were actually able to determine what the continents looked like uh, before this great drunk jump up and what it looked like after, and also what they determined to be the cause of this. And so here's the map that they produce. You can see it in their paper. So that's kind of the before and after. 
And so what's the time scale separating those two events? Less than 130 million years. And I shared that with my wife, she said, that's really a long time. <laughs> I said, well not if you're looking at 4,562 uh, million years. This is really just a brief whisper of time. By the way, it's that or less. Uh, but notice, you go from just a small amount of continental landmass uh, to continents being almost as big as they are today. Incidentally, they got a name for that uh, supercontinent. It's Kenora Land. It's the first of the supercontinents uh, that showed up. And what you see thereafter is basically the supercontinent cycle, uh, where planet Earth goes from having one big continent, where it splits into small continents, and it comes back together into one big continent and splits up into continents and, uh, and then comes back together again. There's been six cycles of the supercontinent, the last one being Pangaea. I bet you everybody here has heard of Pangaea, right? Okay, well, Pangaea is the last one. That was a quarter of a billion years ago. And this is Kenora Land, uh, which showed up about uh, 2.2 uh, <coughs> uh, uh, million years ago. Yes? When the, when the continents start to appear, why do they all appear in the same place instead of all over the globe? Well, it's because of the way plate tectonics kicks in. And uh, you need life to really keep the plate tectonics going. <coughs> so there's no accident that the origin of life is the same date as the origin of plate tectonics. Yeah, and the first, I mean, you get a couple of small volcanic islands, and the first thing you see is what they call a single craton. Craton's a word for a small continent. And so you get this one small uh, craton, and uh, then you get two, and by the way, the two you get are basically Western Australia and South Africa. Uh, those are the two first continental land masses to form. They still exist today. In fact, if you look at this map over here, notice Australia hasn't changed much yeah. over the past 2.4 billion years. It's basically the same. And uh, incidentally, it shows you there the first of the continental land. So the little craton in Western Australia is equivalent to what you see here in South Africa, so you get two small ones, and then it really begins to kick in explosively. Now the thing you notice here is they show some shaded parts here. That's basically stuff that's below sea level, but not a whole lot below sea level. So like there may be only one or two hundred feet of sea above those spots, and so uh, it only needs a little bit of tectonic activity to push them above the surface uh, of the water. So here you've got a lot of potential continents that are not yet above sea level, and suddenly they're all uh, pushed up there. Yes? In lay language, how <coughs> can they make that map that happened two and a half billion years ago? Okay, yeah. what they did is they went into 290 shale boreholes. So they looked at shale all around the world. In fact, they, they basically said in the paper, we went to all seven continents, <coughs> found shale in all seven continents, different places, they and they're able to date the shales and able to determine that the shales appeared explosively. That's what the addition of oxygen 17 did. With oxygen 18, they kind of get a temperature change, and the temperature change tells them. Basically, this is the same time that the temperature of the Earth drops by a big factor. And they basically said, well, the reason why it's dropping by a big factor, you're getting the formation of these continents. And they were able to determine that with oxygen 18. Oxygen 18 gave them the temperature change over the history. But it wasn't able to give them the detail that you get here. It's the addition of the oxygen 17 isotope that told them it was an explosive event, not a gradual event, and uh, was sufficiently dramatic that you actually get a really big supercontinent, Kenora Land. So yeah, they were able to come up with this detailed map. The yellow stuff is basically the new formation. The orange material is stuff that would have formed first. It formed first. The other thing that they were also able to determine was this is the first time you get mountain ranges. And so what you got here are basically little small continents or cratons that are like a thousand feet above sea level or less. But as you move into Kenora land, you actually get big mountain ranges uh, showing up. So, yes? So is this all pretty much due to volcanism? That's basically due to the, the plate tectonic activity. So volcanism is a part of plate tectonics. Wouldn't that raise the temperature of the atmosphere? Well, 
What's happening is that uh, you know the th this is coincided with what's called the great oxygenation event, and so uh, there's a wholesale change in the chemistry of the Earth and a wholesale change in the tectonics. Uh, this is something that I've written about in Improbable Planets. If you want the details, they're in there. But this new paper is basically telling us is that it's much more explosive than what we thought. So rather than being something that was gradually occurring over a half billion years, it's really taking place over just a hundred million years. And rather than we're seeing the continental landmass go from 5% up to 20%, it goes from 2% up to 27%. So it's a much more... And we're at 33% now? Right now we're at 29%. So yeah, since this event, we've only increased the continental land mass coverage by 2%. And uh, before that, it was 2% or less. So learning went from 2% to 27%. Or to put it another way, the increase in continental land mass between this figure and that figure is 12 or 13 times. So in a very short window of time, the continental land mass has increased by 12 to 13 times. When did the Americas start forming? Well, one of those mountain ranges is the Appalachians. I'm not sure which one it is, but <laughs> one of those is the Appalachians. So, yes. Can we have ice and water of the three forms? Uh, we did, and uh, the great oxygenation event, because uh, when you pump oxygen in the atmosphere, it pulls carbon dioxide and especially methane out of the atmosphere. Those are powerful greenhouse gases. And so that caused the temperature of the Earth to, to plummet. Plummet so much, it initiated huge ice ages. And they're not ice ages like we've been having the last couple of million years. They're having what they call snowball or slush ball events. Say, so what's the slush ball event? Well, a snowball event is when more than 90% of the planet is covered with thousands of feet of ice. A slush ball event is where it's more than 80%. And so you get kind of like a little thin line around the uh, equator uh, where it's not frozen over but everywhere else it is. Uh, but yeah, there were uh, several uh, big slush ball and snowball events that took place when the oxygen jumped up. And by the way, the oxygen jump, they call it the great oxygenation event. It's when the oxygen content in the atmosphere goes from one, t one ten thousandths of a percent up to two percent. Okay, today is 21%, but that's uh, the, the next big oxygenation event is what happened at the Cambrian explosion, and that's where it jumped from 1% up to 8%, then 10%, and 20%. Those are called minor oxygenation events. This first one is called the great oxygenation event. You say, gee, it's only 2%. Yeah, but they're looking at the number of decimals. You're going from one ten thousandths of a percent up to 2%, so that's like five orders of magnitude greater oxygen in the atmosphere. And that had a dramatic impact on the chemistry of the atmosphere and paved the way uh, for what we call eukaryotic life forms. Say, so what kind of life forms are those? Those are life forms where the cells have a nucleus. Uh, they've got a Golgi apparatus in there. Basically, you're getting complex cells, which enables complex life uh, to come into existence. Yes, Doug. South Africa. Right. Kind of. Well, like the, yeah, I mean, if you look in uh, kind of like uh, uh, eastern uh, South Africa, uh, there's a craton there that dates back before this time. And likewise, in Western Australia, there's a craton that dates before this time. Okay. I know mankind came from the Africa area, the Red Sea, or whatever. Well, prokaryotic life has been around for 3.825 billion years. <clears throat> That's life based on cells that uh, don't have a central nucleus. Uh, but this event led to the emergence of more complex uh, cellular life. So, okay. Um, any other questions before we jump into the lesson?
Hey, I'm going to be writing a blog on this. It'll be out in the middle of June. Uh, I write a blog every week on some new scientific discovery. And incidentally, there's actually a second paper I'll talk to you about next week, which actually identifies and affirms what happened on creation day four. So yeah, in one week, we have these two papers that give us stunning new affirmation of what Genesis 1 has been claiming for thousands of years. Isn't this a wonderful time to be alive? Okay, yes. go ahead, John. Curiosity. Well, that's difficult to say, John, because there are no seismographs around there to measure it. And, uh, I mean, we do know that the tectonic activity was much stronger back then than it is today. However, tectonics is complicated. Sometimes uh, you get plates moving against one another, or you get thousands of small movements of the Earth that hardly anybody notices what's happening. Other times the plates get locked, but there's stress there that builds up, and then suddenly it shifts like this, and you get a massive earthquake. Uh, what we do know is that there was plenty of tectonic activity going on back then, more so, so than today. But exactly what kind of tectonics, we don't have the seismographs to tell you. So, I mean, volcanoes are part of that as well. Uh, but, you know, so plates can move uh, slowly, and then they can lock and uh, cause uh, big earthquakes. Probably safe to say you wouldn't want to see it. Well, I'll give you an example. If you go a little bit north here in California, you run into something called the Pinnacles. Any of you ever been to the Pinnacles? Okay, a few of you have. Okay. The Pinnacles is a mountain range here in California that sat, sits right on top of the San Andreas Fault. And it actually split this mountain range into two pieces. And so one side of the mountain went this way, the other side went this way. Guess how far apart they are today? More than 200 miles apart from one another. But they call them the pinnacles because the San Andreas Fault literally sheared the mountain range right in the middle. So you've got a cliff face on this side and a cliff face on this side. So you've got a gradual incline up and it just sharply drops down. And a matching side. Yeah, matching side. So you actually put the two pieces together, you can fit them in like, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. But most of that movement was not as a result of big earthquakes. It's re most of the movement was a result of just having lots of little movements taking place gradually over time and literally pushing those two uh, pieces of the mountain apart from one another by more than 200 miles. Hey, if you've never been to the Pinnacles, that's a great place to go because, yeah, you just see this gradual incline up and then you're just going to get a clip face on the other side. It's fun to climb up and kind of look out over the valley. And it's only 2,000 feet high, so fun place to go. Okay, yes, one more comment? No? Okay. Let me exit this and uh, pull up our lesson in Isaiah. Oh, and one thing I was able to do for you is all of Isaiah passages that speak about the cosmic beginning. I actually typed them all up here, so uh, you got this as a nice little collection. Unfortunately, this morning, uh, the toner on my printer ran out, so I've got maybe 12 copies here. That's it. It's two pages. Next week, I'll bring enough for all of you, uh, but you might want to share, and if someone can find a photocopier, we could actually get some for all of you. Uh, so that's a list of all the uh, scriptures, and for those of you who are new here to the class, kind of what we did, we spent 15 minutes in the class breaking up into small groups of four each. And we went through the entire book of Isaiah and gathered up all the verses that pertain to the beginning of the universe and wound up with about 30 verses that we whittled down to about 24 verses. And those are the passages. And yeah, it's uh, two pages, by the way, so you're going to need two pages. But these are the passages we wound up with after we edited out a few. And now we're kind of going through these texts and basically seeing what they got to say about the beginning of the universe. And we're spending some time on this because of all the books of the Bible, the book of Isaiah says the most about the beginning of the universe. Um, now, of course, there's a famous passage in Genesis 1.1, Hebrews 11.3, 1 
Jeremiah jumps into this, the book of Job jumps into this, but Isaiah gives the most complete uh, description of the beginning of the universe. And I'm going to just rapidly rap go through the ones we've already covered, and then we'll kind of slow down when we get to the ones we haven't covered yet. Okay. <clears throat> Begins in Isaiah 6 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, as glory fills the whole earth, namely every part of God's creation reveals God's glory. None of it is wasted, every one of it communicates something about the glory of God. And actually, we're going to look at passages that talk about how every component actually tells something about his plan of salvation. Isaiah 14, 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have purposed, so it will be, as I have planned it, so it will happen. Bottom line, there are no accidents or random outcomes. Every outcome and event in the history of the universe has a purpose, and we need to look for that. This is actually something we discussed in the debate I had with Peter Atkins, because he was trying to, make, trying to make the claim that, hey, most of what we see in the universe has no purpose, no benefit, no value. And so I was able to challenge him on that and say, no, I think everything we see in the universe has purpose, has value, has a plan. We just need to look for it. Uh, it's not gratuitous. Isaiah 14, 27, the Lord of hosts himself has planned it. Therefore, who can stand in its way? It is his hand that is outstretched. So who can turn it back? And nothing stands in the way of God's purposes and plans. Isaiah does talk about a supernatural being who's opposed to God's plans, but is basically making the point not even Satan has any capacity to stop God's plans and purposes in creation. Isaiah 37, 16, The Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you made the heavens and the earth. God is the only agency of creation. There's no other factor. Notice the reference to the cherubim. An excellent cross-reference here is Hebrews 1, because in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is basically addressing uh, this uh, idea that the angels were with God and partners with him in creation. Incidentally, uh, you'll still see a footnote in Jewish Bibles to that effect in Genesis 1. Because there's a text in Genesis 1 referring to God creating humans, where it says, let us create uh, them, male and female. And they said, well, the reference to us and to we, uh, that's the angels. And so God's not the only agency in creation. The angels are involved. That's basically how Jews get around the fact that the Old Testament appears to teach the doctrine of the Trinity. <coughs> but notice Isaiah here saying, the cherubim. The cherubim are the highest angels, and he says, no, God sits above them. Uh, only God is involved in creation. Yes, John? I believe Malachi <coughs> states that only God, they, they have it. Right. Well, this text is consistent with that. Well, how do they get around that one? Well, <laughs> I mean, as you know, we've had some Jews participating here in the class, so the big debate is, okay, <coughs> Uh, where do Christians get this doctrine of the Trinity? And what we're going to see in our study of Isaiah, the Old Testament teaches the doctrine of the Trinity more explicitly and extensively than the New Testament does. But that's something that Jews really struggle accepting. Because you know, Jewish uh, theology is that God is one and only one, one person, not three persons. And so they have to deny what it says there in Genesis 1 and say, well, yeah, it's not that God is two persons or three persons, it's the angels. But this text is making it say, nope, the angels aren't part of it. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 1 goes into that more explicitly. Uh, only God himself is able to create. God is the only agency of creation. Interesting, I mean, we probably remember some of the discussion we had with Jews who were here in the class. If you look at Genesis 1, the only word it uses for God in Genesis 1 is Elohim. Interesting word for God basically means the one who is singular and plural, the uni-plural one. And there's the doctrine of the Trinity right there in the first sentence of the Bible. And in case you don't miss the point, when it talks about the creation of human beings, God uses the singular pronoun and he uses the plural pronoun. Back-to-back -back sentences. One sentence uses singular pronouns, the other sentence uses a plural pronoun. So 
right up off the bat. But we're going to see here in the book of Isaiah, it identifies the Holy Spirit as the creator of the universe, the Son as the creator of the universe, the Messiah, and the Father as the creator of the universe. And look how many times it tells us in the book of Isaiah, there's only one creator. Three people are named as a creator, but there's only one creator. Okay, that's one of the study questions we'll get to. Moving on, Isaiah 45, the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Uh, this is right out of the, uh, Handel's Messiah. Uh, basically making the point, Handel included it in the Messiah, making the point, God's glory is evident to everyone. All have heard. And so it's not just those who have been exposed to the Bible. If you've seen the sky at night, uh, you have seen God's glory. And that's why it tells us in uh, Romans, everyone is not excused. Everyone's been exposed to God's revelation through nature, the book of nature. Isaiah 40, 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked out the heavens? Sorry for the typo there. Uh, with the span of his hand. Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure? Making the point that even a speck of dust, even a single drop of water, is purpose determined and measured by God. Now, if he's so fastidious about a single speck of dust, how much more do you think he cares about you as a human being? And so, basically, it's making the point, hey, even every speck of dust, every drop of water is measured by God. And somebody, when I went over this uh, a couple of weeks ago, said, how much water is there in the universe? Well, there's a lot of water in the universe. Uh, a lot of dust in the universe. It's very dusty and it's very wet. I made the point that water is the third most abundant molecule in the universe, right after hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3. And so the universe is soaking wet, which is kind of ironic when you have NASA saying, we need to follow the water, because where we find water, we're going to find life. Well, we're going to find water everywhere. In fact, the Earth-like planets we're finding have way too much water, 500 to 1,000 times more water than the Earth. And if you got that much water, that discovery I talked about earlier wouldn't happen. The continents would never break the surface of the Earth. And one thing I didn't mention, by the way, in this discovery is that when the continents jump from just a very tiny percentage, 1 or 2% of the Earth up to 27%, that's set in motion the cycling of nutrients from the continents to the oceans and back to the continents. If that hadn't have happened, there'd be no advanced life on Earth. That nutrient recycling is crucial to sustain plants and animals. And so that was all set up at the great oxygenation event. <coughs> okay, Isaiah 40.22. This is where we ended up last time I was here. Uh, very famous passage. God is enthroned above the circle of the Earth. <coughs> Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. So basically making the point, you know, God is able to take care of things here on earth from a perspective so far away, we look like grasshoppers. And yeah, we got into a little discussion. I mean, we have a flat earth uh, creationists trying to claim this text as proof that the earth is a circular disk. Uh, but hey, uh, the whole point here, only a sphere looks like a circle from all perspectives above. And so this text is actually cited as one of the biblical texts supporting a spherical earth. Uh, it's not uh, for a flat earth. Then we ended with, he stretches out the heavens like a thin cloth. He spreads them out like a tent to live in. This is the first of several passages we'll be looking at in Isaiah that speaks about the expansion of the universe. Uh, there are seven passages in Isaiah. Uh, that use the verb nata with respect to the Hebrew verb nata with respect to the universe. Translated here, stretching out of the universe, uh, the verb nata, if you look it up in the lexicon, really means the expansion of whatever is being described. And so it would actually be better translated, he expands the universe. But he expands it like a thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Just this past week, uh, while I was in London, I got all kinds of questions of both my Twitter page and my Facebook page saying, okay, I've heard that the universe is expanding. What is expanding into? 
is it expanding into empty space? I had to explain to him, well, no, space only exists on the surface of the universe. And they said, well, what's this surface? Says, well, it's got three dimensions, not two. Help me visualize this as I can't, okay? Uh, you can only visualize dimensional uh, uh, properties in the dimensions you personally experience. But to give you an analogy, it's kind of like planet Earth. Earth has got three dimensions, and we humans live on the two-dimensional surface of the three-dimensional Earth. And so people also ask me a question, where is the center of the universe? And I said, well, that's like asking someone who's constrained to the surface of the Earth saying, where is the center of the Earth? If all you can access is the surface, nobody is at the center. Well, all the stars, galaxies, planets, moons, uh, even the space-time dimensionality is constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe. And again, don't try to visualize it. It's something we can prove, uh, but it's something we can't visualize. You say, gee, that's kind of a, uh, inconvenient. <laughs> well, <clears throat> the universe is basically a four space-time dimensional system. And yeah, I mean, trying to visualize uh, four dimensions geometrically uh, can't be done, but it can be uh, tackled uh, with mathematics. I think I gave this example a couple of years ago in the class about when I took a sophomore mathematics class in complex variables at the University of British Columbia, the professor showed us a video clip of a basketball in four dimensions of space being turned inside out. And the amazing thing is if you've got four dimensions of space, you can turn that basketball inside out without making a single cut or slip in the surface of the basketball. Now, he didn't show it to us in four dimensions. He did kind of what a real estate agent does. He shows you your new home in two-dimensional slices from different perspectives. And that's what this clip did. It showed us the basketball being turned inside out in two dimensions from one perspective, another two dimensions, different perspective, another two dimensions. And so he said, hey, uh, it definitely works. And then the professor had the audacity to say, okay, you've got a week to prove it mathematically. That was our assignment for the week. So, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a challenge, but we were able to determine, hey, this really happens if you've got four dimensions. Now, if you want to really pack oranges close together, if you've got one million independent dimensions of space, you can take spherical oranges and put them in a one-dimensional box where there's zero space between the oranges. That's a little more complicated math problem that you can take home and work on, okay? So strange things happen when you do that, and that's why I'm saying the universe has those strange features. However, this actually has apologetic value. Okay, if you're going to come up with a religion as a human being, you're going to write about that religion in a way that you can visualize with your mind. And notice that's the case with every holy book outside of the Bible. If you look at the Quran, everything it writes is something you can visualize from our human you know, experience perspectives. Same thing with the Hindu Vedas. Uh, that's why their discussions about heaven, for example, are so different than what you see in the Bible. And this actually had a factor in my coming to faith in Jesus Christ, is realizing that this book we call the Bible contains things that we can't visualize from a human perspective, which was a clue to me that comes from a mind that can visualize those perspectives someone from beyond the universe. The Trinity is one example. And this is one reason why Jews, for example, in their study of the Old Testament, reject the doctrine of the Trinity because they're wanting to have a God that they can visualize. But God being beyond the universe has properties that can't be visualized. However, there are things we can prove that the text actually sustains. So both the New Testament and the Old Testament sustains a description about God that's impossible for us to visualize. <coughs> and you've heard me say this before in a class, and I got a blog article on this, science only makes sense if God is triune. So independent of the Bible, we can establish that God is the Trinity. And I've actually tried that on friends that are Muslims, basically saying, okay, if you trust science, notice that from a, an Islamic perspective, you wind up with a God 
that's contradicting what we can see revealed in science. But in Christianity, there is no contradiction. It fits because God is triune. Yes, Doug. Well, the wonderful thing about the physical sciences, we're confronted with all kinds of things that we can't visualize, but we know must be true. A good example is quantum mechanics. A lot of stuff in quantum mechanics. I mean, that's the thing. When you're teaching students physics and introducing the quantum mechanics, they say, okay, if I'm going to understand quantum mechanics, I've got to visualize all the phenomena going on here, <coughs> saying that can't happen. Uh, if it, that's your goal, then you're going to have a real hard time passing this course. Just simply be satisfied with understanding that it's true. You don't have to be able to visualize it. And so, so it seems kind of arrogant for like, anybody to <coughs> want to try to put God in a box like that, like some of the world's religions seem to want to do, right? Maybe well, God for, even views that as arrogance, you know what I mean? Yeah. That was evidence for me that the Vedas and the Quran, uh, you know, the writings of the Zoroastrians, uh, the Buddhists, came from a human mind and were not inspired by the one that transcends the universe because they showed the limitations of human visualization. Whereas the Bible has all kinds of doctrines that defy what we human beings can visualize. And yet we can show, just like with quantum mechanics, we can't visualize it, but we know it's true. Likewise with the universe. Okay, back to this thin cloth that spreads out like a tent to live in. Okay, lots of questions. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, one from the virtual audience. Great. <laughs> Okay, I think I get the question, and uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, we always love participants from the virtual audience. Uh, would the cosmic background radiation look any different if you're in a location, say, 45 million uh, miles or light years away from where you are right now? Well, 45 million light years, that gets you about a third of the way to the Virgo supercluster, the center of the Virgo supercluster. And the basic answer is it would not look a whole lot different. I mean, there is some structure that we can see in the cosmic background radiation relative to the position in the sky. Uh, but the th amazing thing about the cosmic background radiation, it's smooth uh, to uh, four orders of magnitude. I mean, yeah, we have these maps that show these hot spots and cold spots in the cosmic background radiation, but that's only because we're now able to make temperature measurements to one part in a million actually able to make measurements of one millionth of a degree. And there we can see some variation in the hot and cold spots of the cosmic background radiation. But I remember when we were first making these measurements, the map basically just showed one smooth color. And we couldn't see any difference. It was the same temperature all the way across, but that's because we could only make temperature measurements uh, to one ten thousandth of a degree. Uh, the COBE satellite was the first satellite uh, in the late part of the 20th century that could make temperature measurements to one one hundred thousandths of a degree. And there they saw the subtle variations. Now we're down to better than one part in a millionth of a degree. And so we see some detailed maps. Um, I can pull one up here in the computer, but it would take too long. If you go to the Planck website, P-L-A-N-C-K, you'll see the best map that's been produced of the cosmic background radiation. But to answer the question, yeah, if you go far enough away from here, you'll see uh, that the positions of the hot and cold spots have changed, but the map will look the same. It just kind of moves. It's kind of like, you know, looking at, uh, you know, Canada from an airplane uh, when you're over the west or the east. It's still Canada, but you get to have a little different perspective on it. So, but yeah, it's remarkably smooth. Okay, we have another question. Well, you, the, the 
gas 45 billion years, but the if the universe if the universe is only 18 point Ah, okay. I thought he said billion, not million. Sorry. Okay. I think the question he's getting at is the universe is only 13.8 billion years old, but astronomers talk about the universe being many tens of billions of light years across or even bigger, maybe even infinite. Well, there are different perspectives on this, but one thing we know for sure is that the universe that exists today must be a lot bigger than the universe we see through our telescopes. Because the universe we see through our telescopes, we're forced to look back in time. So, for example, when we look at the sun, we see it as it was eight minutes ago. We look at the Andromeda galaxy as it was two and a half million years ago. And the universe is expanding, as this text here speaks about. And so if the universe is expanding, it's getting bigger and bigger as it gets older and older. And since the universe we see through the telescope, pardon me? And it's accelerating. And it's accelerating, yeah. It expands faster at a faster rate with every year that goes by. Is it going faster than the speed of light? Well, it's very close to approaching the speed of light. And, uh, you know, that's, that's another whole issue. Is that, uh, we're right at the speed of light right now. In the future, the universe will expand so rapidly, we won't be able to see all the way back to the cosmic creation event. But yeah, you'd think that the universe, since we is only 13.8 billion years old, uh, must be a maximum of 28 billion light years across. But in fact, it's much bigger than that because you know, the universe that we looked at, say 10 billion uh, light years away, is a universe very much smaller than the universe we see today. So the universe of today is bigger than the universe we see through the telescope. Or as I tell my wife all the time, since I'm an astronomer, I can't be held accountable for the present. I have no access to the present. I can only be held accountable for the past. So, right. So billions of years ago, I can tell you what was happening. But today, no, I really don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, but there are also models of the universe uh, where you, because of the cosmic inflation event, where the universe would even be bigger than that. And so people say, well, how big is the universe of today? The figure that's bandied around most is it's probably somewhere around eight or 900 billion light years across. It could be smaller, it could be bigger. Some models even say it could be infinite. Now, it's finite in age, uh, but some models actually permit the space to go out. And it's basically on the geometry. The geometry measures to be flat. If the universe is flat, the space goes out to infinity. Uh, if it's spherical, then it's finite. If it's hyperbolic, it goes out to infinity as well. And it measures to be flat to about four places of the decimal. And actually, that's what you'd want if you want life in the universe. So yeah, it's bigger than the billions of light years that we can see. But back to this question about the analogy how everything in the universe is constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional universe. I find it interesting. It talks about how he stretches out the heavens, expands the universe like a thin cloth, and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Now, people have made the point, maybe this isn't exactly what the text is saying, but it is consistent with the idea that the reality of the universe is a surface. And just like a tent is a surface material, a thin material, and the reality of the tent is a surface, now it's inside, now it's outside. And people say, well, what's the universe expanding into? It's expanding into nothing. Beyond the space surface of the universe is nothing. Inside the space surface of the universe is nothing. And you say, well, what's out there? Well, just wait. The space surface will expand and get there. Uh, but beyond the space surface is nothing. Interior, there's nothing. It really is kind of like a thin uh, cloth, uh, like a tent, spread in such a way that human beings can live within the universe. So it's possible that you might even take this beyond just a mere metaphor to literally speaking about the shape of the universe. Yes? Do in all the places that talks about the heavens being spread out, is, are those words in uh, continuing present tense? No. <laughs> The 11 texts that talk about the universe expanding show up in all three Hebrew verb forms. 
This has come up in a number of debates I've had, especially with Michael Shermer, the Skeptic Society not far away from here. He's been making the point that they're all in the present tense, they're not. Um, that uh, it's in all three Hebrew verb forms and basically making the point that God created the universe with the property that would guarantee that it would continue to expand. Um, so the fact that we see it in all three Hebrew verb forms means these are more than just figures of speech. The Bible literally is speaking about the universe expanding. Incidentally, this came up in my debate with Peter Atkins. <coughs> he said, well, you're just reading this into the Bible because you know this stuff is true from your knowledge of astronomy. Uh, who said this before uh, Big Bang came along? And I said, well, lots of Jewish theologians actually saw Big Bang cosmology in the Old Testament eight, nine hundred, a thousand years ago. So it's not just 21st century astronomers that are reading this into the text. Okay, got a few more minutes. Let's go on to another passage. Yes. Um, I'd like to, us to consider uh, the verb forms, and as you know, the participle simple form here of Natal, that it's, and, and in the overall context, what's really important and what I appreciate is that we're talking about the predictive nature of God beyond the ability of man to say things. I don't think this verse or the other seven fit into that. I do think Genesis does, because Natal itself as its participle form, I think, again, you have an article in, I think, June of 2002 on the RTD website that makes a good point that it's used as a noun, it's substantive, and it's, it's he who stretches. And with participles, they have no aspect or equivalent tense, <coughs> of, but depend upon context. And in this verse, it's especially interesting that Nata itself is important to what is stretching and, and what I have found in looking up the top, and we, we also have other things in the verse, it's, it's a very wonderful verse for, for a lot of things to come together. But what I found about the top is it is associated to turning or to stretching out an arm or to, uh, to roll the, the sky back as a scroll, to turn it, to turn morally or, or to be inclined uh, one way or another, not to turn from the left or to the right. And here, I'm pretty convinced, based upon other scriptures and concordism, that, that it is talking about uh, a person or anyone looking at the heavens from the left to the right, from horizon to horizon, uh, even stretching out an arm and saying, God stretches this out, but not, and we can't even read into Natal, a continual expansion that's ongoing. And as we discuss this, that's what I think I'll bring to the discussion is what do we do with participles? What do we do with all the consecutive verbs attached to this participle? <coughs> and, and how do we look at syntax and semantics and, and really etymology of, of Mata itself to stretch? I think God is a stretcher, but he keeps it stretched. He actively holds the universe in place just as he sits on the circle of the universe. Mm -hmm. And this verse uh, is wonderful in that all of the action words except one are participles. And so participles, they become very important. But even more important, and I'll sort of summarize this, is that God expanding to expand even the pasture rakia, um, or is it God stretching a limited left to right? That's hard to tell from the participle, and it really is. But when we look at the word Natal and its etymology, not many people have done that and brought that to the conversation. And it's surprising okay. that Natal will do it. Yeah. One of the articles we have on our website, you'll see John Ray's name along with my name on it. Yes. Okay. That's the one that goes, I think I, think I included that in the fourth edition of the Crater in the Cosmos. I put that one in because it's the more technical article uh, on these 11 texts. And uh, I was reluctant myself to, uh, I saw this in the text when I was reading as a teenager. How far can you push it in terms of Big Bang cosmology? But it was John Ray who came to me and said, I've done a big study on this. Uh, it's a lot more secure than you may think. And he's the one that worked with me to write the original piece where we talked about the verb nata, how it's used in all 11 texts. And if I recall the details, 
uh, nine verbs are in the active participle form. The others are in the perfect or the imperfect form. And he was the one that worked with me and said, it's the fact that it shows up in these three different forms that tells us that, yes, God designed the universe with the property of cosmic expansion, but in addition to that, there's something that on goes. So, uh, yeah, you can take a look at that text because uh, he's the one that basically works through all the uh, Hebrew details. And uh, so, and also the fact that, you know, it's not just people in the 21st century that saw this. But I will concede, this is debated. I mean, we have our debate with our friends of BioLogos, for example. They insist this has got nothing to do with the expansion of the universe. But it's the same group of people who say, we don't think the Bible says anything about cosmology whatsoever. And so, uh, I think it's pretty clear, I think you would agree, it is saying something about cosmology. And yeah, there's a debate about how far we can push it. I think there's a debate, for example, uh, what can we do with this tent analogy? Where did I have that um, here? Can I respond to John Ray? I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good guy, translator of the Bible. Yeah, I mean, he's a good Hebrew scholar. Uh, so. That's on. Uh, yeah. But, uh, so I can't contact him by email. Uh, One day you will. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do contact other people by email. On this. I've gone to Florida uh, to ask the Hebrew professors on the call, call, call participles, which is active. Right, right. Uh, and we, we must, for people here who are not into Hebrew or linguist, we must know that call active participle talks about voice, not about tense of perspective. It's the voice uh, that the subject is active. Right. Now that can be in any past, present, or future. And uh, so we need to look at what active means. It doesn't automatically mean that it's ongoing expansion. Yeah, well, that's true because unlike English, Hebrew doesn't have the equivalent of English, uh, uh, you know, tenses. You know, a lot of scholars have pointed out it's not tense like the way the English language is. So, uh, and yeah, you're right, John Ray is not available to talk to right now. But when I did uh, meet with him, I was impressed that he was fluent in biblical Hebrew. I mean, he is a very good Hebrew scholar, and he's not alone in drawing these conclusions. He consulted with a number of his peers at uh, you know Grace Theological Seminary. So, and the fact is, I mean, uh, there are people long before the 20th century who saw the same point in the text. His comment to me was, if it was only one verse, I'd be hesitant. But the fact that we have 11 texts, uh, he finds that very compelling. But yeah, I do admit it's being debated. That's part of the debate we're having with the friends of Biologos. Steve, you only got like three minutes. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Let us at least uh, make progress on this passage. Look up and see who created these. Who br brings out the starry host by number? He calls all of them by name because of his great power and strength. Not one of them is missing. Now, for those of you who have been with the class for a while, do you remember another passage we looked at, a creation text, that talked about God numbering the stars? Anybody remember that? Psalms, right? Psalm 4. No, it wasn't Psalm 19. Psalm 4. Psalm 147. Psalm 147. Basically making the point that God knows the name of every single star. This is basically making the same point. He calls them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. Well, stars are like human beings. They form... Uh, they burn for a while, and then they die. Uh, so, but this point is making, uh, God knows what each star is going through. And yeah, stars that are, quote, stop burning, they're still around. God knows where they are. None of them are missing. And how many stars are there in the universe? Or I should ask you another question. Have you ever heard of the star registry? where for $54, yeah. you could name the star after a loved one? Okay. I'd probably counsel you not to spend the $54. <laughs> because the truth is, you could name 7 trillion stars after every human being and not run out. And here's another question. How many stars on the star registry are recognized as legitimate names by the International Astronomical Union? Zero. 
So you're spending $54 for nothing. nothing. <laughs> but they do give you a nice little map that shows you where your star is. That's a pitch. So, but I think you can come up with a map for a little less than $54. So, so if you really want to impress... Hey, if you really want to impress your honey, just tell her, I can name seven trillion stars after you. Okay, not just one star. No, let's go all out here, okay? But the whole point here is, God has a name for every star. This was making a point. God has a purpose for every star. Evidently, everyone serves a particular person. He cares for each star. And I tell people, a star is simply a giant ball of hydrogen and helium gas. A human being is a lot more than a giant ball of gas. Okay? A human being is not just... I probably shouldn't have gone there with that one. Sorry. I kind of got away from you. I slipped into that one, so... It was a lunch Right. I got in trouble once and somebody was misunderstanding what I said about gas giants. So. We're out of time. Man. We're out of time. Good thing. <laughs> Let me wrap this up. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you're a God that knows every little speck of dust in the universe, every drop of water, every star. Lord, each one of them is something you care for. Each one of them plays a role in making possible our existence here on planet Earth. And Father, if you know the name of every star, if you care for every speck of dust in the universe, every drop of water in the universe, how much more must you care for each of us human beings? Thank you, Lord, that you created this enormous universe so that we could be here today. Help us, Lord, to find the purpose you've uh, put in place for every star, for every speck of dust, for every drop of water. But more than that, Lord, help us to discover the purpose for why you created us and what role we need to serve in the few decades we have here on planet Earth. Thank you, Lord, for giving us such an incredibly fulfilling career as a follower of you. And Lord, I pray that you would assist us throughout these next few days and weeks uh, to bring many to know you as Lord and Savior so all of us can find purpose in a meaningful, eternal life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you.